What is up my chemistry people? It is Mr. Boylan. And today, what in the heck are we going to do in this video? Que vamos a hacer? Today, we are going to draw qualitative and quantitative connections between the reaction enthalpy and the energies involved in the breaking and formation of chemical bonds. Okay, so breaking it down a little bit as always, uh, first thing we're gonna do is just define the bond breaking process as an endothermic process and the bond making process as an exothermic one. And then two, numero dos. We are going to use average bond energies to calculate the enthalpy change for a chemical reaction. Okay, so first, it's important to understand that all chemical reactions fundamentally are essentially just the making and breaking of bonds. So let's time this out to take a look at a thriller of an animation at the molecular level and think about what happens as the reaction proceeds in terms of breaking bonds and making bonds. Now the reaction we're going to look at is the combustion of methane. And at the molecular level, essentially what happens is we put energy in to break the four CH bonds that make up methane. And then we put in more energy to break the bonds that make up the oxygen molecules. But then, as the water is formed and those oxygen-hydrogen bonds are created, energy is released. Similarly, as we form the carbon-oxygen bonds in carbon dioxide, additional energy is released. And so as you think about the overall chemical reaction, you need to think about how much energy went in to break those bonds, how much energy was released when those new bonds were formed. Energy in, endothermic, endothermic, energy in, breaking bonds, forming new bonds, energy released, exothermic. Okay, so you just need to recognize that energy required to break all of the reactant bonds is just a sum of all of the average bond energy in the reactants and that process is an endothermic one in other words energy must be absorbed in order to break bonds Two, you also have to recognize then that the energy released in making all of the product bonds is just a sum of all the average bond energies that is an exothermic term and in other words that means energy is released when we form new bonds Okay, so the overall enthalpy change in reaction then relates the bond breaking process, endothermic, and the bond making, exothermic processes. The total enthalpy change or the total heat of a reaction can be negative if it's exothermic overall, if more energy is released than we had to put in, or positive overall if we had to put more energy in than was released in the formation of those new bonds. We can then calculate the enthalpy change for a reaction using a list of bond energies and the following understanding. Now you've got to be careful with this because it's very similar or seems very similar to another equation that we use when we're determining enthalpy of a reaction from heats of formation. But this one is using bond energies. So recognize we have to sum together the energies of all the bonds broken, sum together the energy of all the bonds formed, and then subtract the energy of the bond formed from the energy of the bonds broken. In other words, we want the total reactant bonds broken, the total product bonds broken, and then subtract product bonds from reactant bonds. Now, in your notes, you've got a really nifty diagram. Okay, so let's take a look at a thriller of an animation that represents an endothermic reaction. Again, we have to put energy in to break bonds. And then when we make new bonds, energy is released. Now, for an endothermic reaction, we put more energy in to break the bonds than is released when those new bonds form. So our delta H will be positive. So as you think about an exothermic reaction, again, when we break bonds, we have to put heat energy in. When we form new bonds, energy is released. But in an exothermic reaction, the amount of energy released is greater than the amount of energy we put in to break the original bonds. Therefore, in an exothermic reaction, the enthalpy change is negative, simply indicating that more energy is released than went in to break the original bonds. Okay, so then lastly, just a couple of quick things to think about when we think about bonds and bond energies. Remember that bonds are essentially just these electrostatic attractions between opposite charges 
in neighboring atom. Your negative electrons are attracted to the positive nucleus of another atom. Now, it's also important to recognize that if the atoms get too close together, their like charges will repel one another. And so when we think about the bond length between atoms in a covalent bond, it's the distance between the centers of the atoms when the potential energy of those electrostatic interactions is at a minimum. So as you look at your screen, I've got two atoms of oxygen here. And again, what you need to think about as I bring these atoms closer together, the electrons, the negative electrons in the electron clouds are attracted to the nuclei of the neighboring atom. And you can see those attractions indicated by the yellow arrows on your screen. However, you should also note that there are forces of repulsion between the similar charges in those opposing atoms. Now, when we form a bond, we're essentially trying to maximize the attraction and minimize the repulsion. And it's at that point where we minimize the potential energy of those electrostatic attraction that we form our bond and determine bond length and bond energy. And for this unit, we're really concerned about the formation of new bonds and the breaking of old bonds. And because the bond making process is an electrostatic one, in other words, it involves charged particles, it's governed by Coulomb's law. And the simplified form of that law is what you see on your screen there in your notes where the Q values, remember, represent your charges and the R value represents the distance between those charges. Now, why is that important? Well, you need to think about how double bonds and triple bonds are going to be stronger than single bonds since the double and triple bonds contain a greater number of electrons. In other words, the Q values are larger, making the energy of attraction stronger. Your Coulombic attractions are stronger. Similarly, your shorter bonds with atoms closer together to one another tend to be stronger than longer bonds with atoms further apart. And again, as you go back to Coulomb's law, because the distance between the charges is smaller, our denominator energy of attraction is greater. So as you look at and interpret data tables that involve both bond lengths and bond strengths, and you've got an example in your notes and on your screen there, Typically, single bonds are the longest, triple bonds are the shortest, however, triple bonds are the strongest, and single bonds are the weakest. And again, it comes back to Coulomb's Law. Okay, and that's it for today's video. Be sure to check out the references beneath the video where you can find some links to access some of those simulations on your own and practice some of the amazingness that is chemistry.